Greetings, Honors Precalculus class. Um, I said I would make a video um, for you guys so you could see how to do the checkboxes and buttons because it was a little bit rushed at the end of class and it's nice if you have a video so you can actually see how, how things work and watch it at your own pace. So I thought I would do that and also um, at a student's request I'll also show how to put in like the images into the file so in case you want to go for an A plus with your project. Um, so I'm going to actually show you a few different things. So the first is how to do um, a piecewise function parametrically on GeoGebra. So you might say, why would we need that in, um, in our project? Well, if you'll notice in the project, when you're shooting the bullet slash cupcake, um, it's not always there, right? You, you want the bullet to only show up when you're firing the rifle. Um, and then the bullet appears. So essentially it's a piecewise function because you're going to say, all right, I only want the point to be there starting at time equal whatever. So let me just show you how to, how to do that in GeoGebra. So let's actually make, um, let's make a unit circle um, parametrically here. And in order to get this to um, end up being piecewise, I know the normal way that we do it is we start off with t equals zero and then turn on the slider and I'm going to adjust the slider so it starts from 0 and goes to 2 pi and put on an increment of 0.01 okay so there's our slider we've done stuff like this before and the way we did it was we said all right let's have the point it says our ant capital A equal and we put in parentheses for the coordinates and what we used to do is say, all right, cosine t, comma, sine t. Hit enter. There's the ant. And as time goes by, it marches around in the unit circle. Okay, all well and fine. And that works great. But it turns out it's a bit awkward to try to get piecewise to work that way when you put the function directly into the point like that. So rather than doing it that way, I'm going to delete out that point. I'll show you a slightly different way to do it is let's create separate functions for the x coordinate and y coordinate. So in this case I'll just call them f and g. So I'll remember that like f of t will be the x coordinate and g of t will be the y coordinate. So it's going to look something like this. So f of t equals, and you would put in whatever your formula is for the x coordinate, which in this case is cosine t. And it wants to graph it. I actually don't care about the separate graph, so I'm going to hide that. And now let me put in the y coordinate, which I'm going to call g of t, and that will be sine t. And again, it wants to graph it, so I'm just going to hide the graph. So now when we go to capital A for our end point, rather than actually putting in the cosine sine directly here, like what we're used to, I'm going to put in f of t, comma, g of t. And notice it's still, it's basically just like we're used to, it's just I have function names for them now. And it does the same thing. You're like, okay, Mr. Earth, what's the point in that? Well, the point in this, now we can adjust, you can adjust what the function is. So uh, I'm going to come over here to the f of t. And this is what I'm going to, in fact, you know what, I'm just going to delete it and do one from scratch. So let me delete that. And here's what I, I'm going to type. I'm going to type f of t is equal to, and here's the command you need to do if you want to do a piecewise function. You say if brackets, that's the square brackets, and then you put the condition that you want the particular function to, to have. So um, I'm going to say I only want this function to show up as cosine t when it's between 1 and 5. So I'm going to say 1 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 5. Then you say comma, and then you put the function that you want. So cosine t. And it turns out if I wanted some other formulas after that, um, like maybe I want it to be, oh, I want it to be x squared or t squared if, you know, between 5 and 7. You could do that, but for our purpose of the project, this is good enough. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter now. So there's the square bracket. So just to kind of recap, it's f of t equals, but rather than putting the formula, you say if with square brackets, 
And then inside the square brackets, you give your condition, which in this case is 1 less than equal to t less than equal to 5, comma, and then the function. So I'm going to hit enter. And notice what it looks like. It's actually graphing it. And it's the cosine graph, but it only exists between 1 and 5. It doesn't exist outside 1 and 5. The way it shows up on the screen over here is it doesn't actually put the if. It kind of does it like a piecewise function. So if we had more branches, more stuff would show out here after these braces. So right now there's just the one branch. So it says, if your t is in between 1 and 5, do cosine t. If we had other things, it would show up with like bigger braces and show it. Um, and I'm going to do the same thing with the uh, g of t. But this time, now that you see it, I'm just going to edit it directly. Come over here, say, if bracket, oops, not of, if bracket 1 less than equal to t less than or equal to 5 comma come over here close my square bracket hit enter and if you want to see here let me turn off the cosine graph put on the sine graph there's the sine graph exists between one and five all right so now let's put our parametric ant on here so capital a is equal to and i'm going to use f of t comma g of t and you're like where is it where's my a over here it says a is undefined because my time is zero since time is zero, that's not between 1 and 5, the A doesn't exist yet. So what's going to happen is, as time creeps on, here's the time moving, and then boom, suddenly the A appears. It starts, it becomes into existence at the 1 second mark, keeps on existing until the 5 second mark, and then it disappears again. So, that's a way to kind of make things sometimes appear and disappear when you need it to to happen. That's kind of the fancy schmancy way using these piecewise functions using the if command. Okay, so now let's actually go ahead and make a checkbox which will actually make the t and hence the ant move by itself. So let me show you how to make the checkbox. So you come over here, oh it's, sorry I was playing with it before, so normally it looks like just this slider little button here, but if you come over here to hit the little red triangle aspect to it, and click down, you'll see you can do buttons and input boxes and check boxes. So let's make a little checkbox. So you click here, and it looks like nothing happened, but it's waiting for you to click somewhere on the page. And when you click somewhere, that's where it's going to put the checkbox. So I'll just click right over here. And it opens up this window. And the first thing you can put on is the caption. And I want to point out caption's actually not the name of the variable. Caption is just some text that's going to show up by the uh, by the checkbox. So um, I'm just going to call it, doesn't matter what we call it, so I will just call it uh, move the ant. And there's a little pull down thing that you can do stuff with. We're actually not going to monkey with that right now. So I'm just going to put this caption on here and click apply. And it made a little checkbox with a check already in there with the caption move the ant. Now the actual name of this, if you hover over it, it says boolean value A. And if you come over here into the algebra panel, you'll see it has this Boolean va value A. A Boolean value is like a regular variable, but instead of holding a number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it only holds one of two possible things. Either it holds true or false. And the way it knows whether true or false is depending whether you put the checkbox here. So right now I'm still in checkbox mode, so I'm going to move over to move mode. And now when I click in the box, it'll put a check there or not, and if you look over here on the algebra screen, it'll change this from true to false. So I'm going to check here, it turns it off, and it made this be false. I check it again, it makes it be true. Now as it stands right now, we haven't coded anything, so this checkbox is absolutely nothing other than toggle the trueness and falseness of this variable called A. What we want to do is have it control the motion of T. So how do you do that? This is sort of a two-step process. So I'm going to come over here and right-click on my checkbox and go to where it says object properties and we're going to do something that we haven't done before we're going to go to the advanced tab oops nope sorry the scripting tab so we go to the scripting tab and this lets you write a little bit of like programming code into here so now don't worry we're just going to put in one command so you see the number one here you can actually put like a ton of different commands in here we're only going to put in one command and the one command we're going to do is called start animation. And it needs to be in something called upper camel case, which means when you write the word start animation, you squish it all together into one word, so you don't put any spaces when you say start animation, 
and every single word starts with a capital letter. That's called upper camel case. So it's going to look like this. Start animation. Notice the capital S and the capital A. That's actually important. Notice there's no space in between start animation. Now this is a function. It's kind of a strange function. You're not used to functions being start animation. You're used to functions being equations. But this is a function, so I've got to put parentheses here. And what you're going to put inside the parentheses is the thing you want to start animating which in this case is our time variable t. So here in the start animation parentheses, I'm going to put a t. Oops, not tg, t. And that's it. That's the one command this is going to do. And notice it's in the tab that says on update. So on update means that when the status of this box changes, it will implement this command, and this command is start animation. So, all right, we're good. I'm going to close this window. So right now my checkbox is off. And my claim is, is that when we put a check in there, it will update the status and start the animation of T. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to click this and boom. Notice the T started by itself. And then the A is going to appear here and it's going to cycle around. And there it goes. And notice that it's set to oscillate, so it's going to actually go backwards on the other end. I'm, I'm going to change that because I actually don't like that. Now, one other thing we're going to have to do is because on the update it just says start animation, there's nothing that stops it. So even if I click this off, right, it's still animating. I'm like, no, I what I want to have happen is when I click it, it animates, and when I click it off, it doesn't animate. That's what I want to have happen. So just putting the object properties with this coding isn't quite enough. I'm going to have to do something else as well. So now I'm going to right click on the T and go to it, its object properties. And here we're going to go to scripting. And again, on update. And this time we're going to say start animation. Again, in upper camel case, so the capital S and capital A, all is one word. And this time we're going to put in the parentheses is A. So we're putting in the name of the variable. So what this is saying is as long as A is checked, which makes the A be true, Yes, your start animation will be on. However, when A is false, it'll be false that the animation will be on, and it'll actually stop now. So let's actually check that this works. So right now the animation is on, and I'm going to uncheck the box. Oh, and it froze. So click it on, it's in motion. Click it off, it's not. So that's what we want. So just to recap, it's a two-step process. You've got to do it on the checkbox itself, and also on the thing you're animating. The command is start animation and capital S, capital A, no space. When you do this one, you put it as what you're animating, which could have been multiple things, right? So, but we're just animating the T. And then over here, you put in start animation, parentheses, the Boolean variable that you want to control when it starts and stops. All right, let's change it so it's not doing that oscillating thing anymore, because I don't know if you guys noticed, but when I animate it with this click button, it's going up to 2 pi, 6.28, and then it's backing up. So it's just kind of going back and forth, back and forth. I just want it to go forwards. So let me stop the animation there. So here's what you do, is you go to Object Properties on the T. And when you're in the slider, this very option here says Repeat. And you got, if I click down here at this arrow, we got all these options. Oscillating means back and forth. In excuse me, increasing just means going up. Decreasing means going down. Increasing once means it'll increase one and stop automatically but I want increasing. Another thing you can do is change the speed. Now this isn't the speed in terms of like when we think of the speed of the ant. This is just the speed of the animation. Um, so I actually wanted to go a little bit faster than what it was going, so I'm going to put it speed 3. That might be a little bit fast, but let's see. And I'm going to check my checkbox here for move the ant. And notice it's just going up and it just starts over again. So swinging around, swinging around. All right. Cool. All right. I think we're ready to take a look at how to do checkboxes now. So, um, or not checkboxes, I'm sorry. We just did checkbox. how to make buttons. So if you want to make a button, come over here to where we did the checkbox and click the little triangle and move down to where it says button. Okay. Again, nothing seems to happen. It's waiting for you to click on a spot for where you want to put the button. So how about I want to put it, uh, I don't know, right here underneath the move ant. So I click here. And again, it wants a caption. And I think what I want this button to do is um, 
How about it moves the ant to the North Pole? So I'm going to call this caption, I'll say, move to North Pole. Now, normally you'd put in your commands right here, um, but I'm just going to click OK so you can see what this is going to look like. So it makes a button, and inside the button it says move to North Pole. So notice I'm still in button mode, so I'm going to go back to move mode and click this button, and absolutely nothing happens. Because we haven't written the command, even though it's called move to North Pole, the computer doesn't know what that means to do yet, right? It's just text that's showing up on this button. So we haven't written the code for it. So what we want to do is, so our North Pole is basically right there. So I'm going to go here. Okay, well, let me show you how to move buttons and check boxes around. Let's say I decide I don't want that move button that button right there. What if I want it on top? Right now I can't actually grab it and move it. It thinks I'm trying to push it. It's the same thing with a checkbox. It seems like you can't move a checkbox. It tries to check it. So what you need to do if you want to move something is right click on it and turn off the fixed object. And now you can actually move it. And the same thing here. If I right click on this and turn off the fixed checkbox, now you can grab the checkbox and move it wherever you want. I'll put it, I'll just put it right there, fine. All right, um, well, now let's actually go to the button and go Object Properties and go to where it says Scripting and let's go to where it says On Click. So, I'm on the tab that says On Click. Now, what this is going to say is, as soon as you click this button, do whatever we put in the commands here. So the thing I want in the command is I want the A to go to the North Pole. So if we sort of think about it, the thing that controls the position of the ant is the time. And in order for the ant to be at the North Pole, the time would be pi halves. So I'm just going to come over here, and the command I'm going to say is T equals pi over 2. And that's it. We're done. So watch what's going to happen. I'm right now my ant is over here. I can move the ant with the time just like normal. But if I click the move to North Pole button, boom, it set the time to be 1.57 blah 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 pi over two, and the ant moved to the North Pole. So I can put the ant in motion, and anytime I want, I can click the move to North Pole button, and there it goes. It's still in motion. If I want to stop it, do that. All right. So that is how buttons work. All right, so now let me show you how to put the pictures into GeoGebra. Now again, this isn't something you need to do for your project unless you want to go for that A+. You can still get an A even if your points just look like points and your circles and lines look like circles and lines. But if you want to be sort of fancy schmancy and make it really look like, you know, the Ferris wheel looks like a Ferris wheel, or the kitten looks like a kitten, and the bullet or cupcake looks like a cupcake, um, you should do it with grabbing images. So let me show you how to do that. So instead of a point moving around a circle, I'm going to make it be a cupcake moving around a circle. So the first thing I'm going to do is grab an image of a cupcake and put it into GeoGebra. So let me show you how to do that. So I jumped to my browser and here I am on the Google uh, page. I'm going to click where it says images, so I'll just search for images. And I'm just going to put in cupcake and see what we get. Hopefully all the pictures are over Hawk and appropriate. All right, so let me wait for it to load up a little bit. It's being a little pokey. All right, so I'm gonna choose this one. So I'm gonna take that image, click on view image. So there we go, there's my cupcake picture. And I'm gonna right click on it and go to copy image. So at this stage, it's, um, it's in my sort of virtual clipboard. So I'm going to go back to GeoGebra. And if I come over here to edit, there's an option that says insert image from clipboard. Now, if you, save, if you have a file saved somewhere, you can actually do it file, and it lets you browse to the spot that you've saved the... Uh, save the picture, but I'm just going to do it from the clipboard and click on that. And let's just think for a second because it's kind of a large picture. All right, there we go. You'll also see, by the way, these two dots appear. Um, there's some fancy schmancy ways to adjust it so it's not the two dots. Um, we'll just keep things nice and simple and use these two dots. What these two dots allow you to do is resize the picture. So you can grab, I'm just grabbing this and moving these two points closer 
You can also rotate the picture like this. So I'm going to shrink it down so it's about that size and maybe rotate it just so it's diagonal, something like that. Eh, yeah. All right. Um, and now if I want, I can also grab the entire picture and move it like this around. I just grabbed it from the picture rather than the point. So the points let you resize it and rotate it around. And grabbing the picture as a whole lets you move it. But now you're like, okay, I want this to move around here. How am I going to do this? So this gets slightly tricky. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a second cupcake picture. And we're going to create the sec sec second cupcake picture by translating this one to be on top of this point. So how do we do that? The way translation works is it works with vectors. So I want, here's what I want to have happen. I want the center of this cupcake to be centered on that A point. So I'm just going to create a point right here, go to point mode, and put it right at the center of the picture. And then the way you make a vector is you come over here to what's, sorry, I was already in vector mode. So it's normally your segment mode or your line mode, but you come over here, hit the triangle, and there's an option down here that says vector. So you click on that, and the way vector works is you click where your starting point is, and then you go to your ending point. So I want a vector which starts where the cupcake is, the center of the cupcake, and you drag the vector, see the little arrow, and you drag it to where you want it to end up at, which is going to be right there. So I want the center of the cupcake to start it from here and actually move to there. So it creates this vector u, and this is the vector form. It looks like this weird parentheses thing. And this is essentially telling you the magnitude and direction of the vector. We'll learn more about this later in pre-calc, but some of you who had physics may already know what vectors are. So think of a vector as telling you how far away to move something and in what direction you should move it. So here is our picture, and I want to sort of slide along this vector so that the spot, that the center spot, which was at D, becomes A. So you come over here, which the default one looks like this. It's a reflect about line, but we don't want reflect about line. We got to come down here and move down to where it says translate by vector. So I'm going to click that button, translate by vector. So, oh, you know, before I do this, let me just show you something about this point A. This vector, since it always starts at D and ends at A, that means I could move the D around and the vector moves because it starts at D and goes to A. But most importantly, I can move the A around, and I move the A by moving the time, and it stretches the vector. So that's the beauty of doing this with the vector because now if I tell it move D to A, even though A is moving, it'll move the picture with it. So, all right, so now let's do the translation. So you click on the translate, by vector button. And first you put what you want to translate and then you click the vector. So I want to translate this picture, so make sure you highlight the picture. So don't click the points or the, any of that, just click on the picture and then you click on the vector. You can either click on the picture or you can click on it over here in the algebra pane. So I'll click it on the picture and boom, it made a second cupcake. Now this second cupcake will always start at D and end up at A. So when A moves, oops, sorry, I'm still on that. Let me move on the move button. When A moves, that cupcake is going to move. And now all the rest of the stuff I don't care about. I can hide it. So I'm going to hide that point, hide that point, hide that point, and I can even hide the original picture. The only time you would really need the original picture is if you decided, I want to resize it, and then you can like resize it and use the original picture. But once you got it the way you want, it actually doesn't matter. So I'm going to hide the picture by right-clicking and click on toggle off the show object. In fact, I don't even need the vector anymore, so I'll come and click on this blue dot. So there we go. And notice the cupcake disappears. It only exists between 1 and 5 because I said translate to the point A, and the point A only exists between 1 and 5. In fact, now I can even hide the point A. And now it just looks like the cupcake is moving around. So it says move ant. I'm going to rename it now. And instead of saying move the ant, I'm going to say move the cupcake. So 
So now I click move the cupcake, and the cupcake moves around. All right, let me show you how to do one last fancy schmancy thing here. And what if I want it where right now it's a, I don't know what that is, some sort of, you know, strawberry flavored cupcake. Maybe I want it to be a strawberry flavored cupcake when it's in the northern part of the picture, but then magically become a chocolate cupcake when it's in quadrants three and four in the southern part of the picture. So how would I do that? So um, let me put, let's actually get ourselves a picture of a chocolate cupcake. So I'm going to jump back here, back up to cupcake, look for a different picture. So, hmm, I guess there's a chocolate cupcake. So I'll grab that one. So copy image, go back to GeoGebra, go edit, insert image from, clipboard, I'm going to shrink it down. Okay, if I really want to be fancy, I'd clip away this, um, this boundary. Um, I'm debating if I want to do that or not. Eh, we'll just keep it ugly like this. So, um, so there's my chocolate cupcake. So let me put the A point back on so I can use it as a vector. So I gotta put some center point on over here and say, all right, let's make the vector. I'm going a little faster now because we know how to do this. Oops, oops, if I click correctly, maybe I shouldn't go faster. All right, start here, go to there. Right, this is not working. Okay, vector mode. Oh, because I wasn't in vector mode, I was in translate mode. My bad. Here's the vector button. Click here, go to there. Now I hit translate. Translate the image by this vector. Okay, so right now it's kind of overlapping this, which is like not so great. Um, let me go ahead, let me hide the stuff we don't need anymore. So I don't need the vector anymore. I don't need these points anymore. I don't even need this original picture anymore. So I'm going to hide the original picture. All right. So what we have right now is I have both the chocolate and the strawberry cupcake, both at the point at the same time. But what I want to have happen is it's only the strawberry in the top half. And then somehow it looks like it turns chocolate when it's in the bottom half. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to take the chocolate picture, go to right click on it, go to object properties, and go to where it says advanced. And if you notice, there's a tab here that says condition to show object. So if I'm going to be in the southern half of the picture, that means uh, my angle, or in this case my time, is more than pi. So my condition to show the object is that time is bigger than pi. And notice it just disappeared. Now it turns out it will reappear once my time is bigger than pi. So if I drag it and move to pi, oh, there it is again. And really we should also make the strawberry one disappear. So I'm going to go over here, object properties, and under advanced, under condition to show object, I'm going to say the time has to be less than or equal to pi. And I can hide my point A. And so now, when I move the cupcake, it starts strawberry, becomes chocolate. Remember, it only exists between 1 and 5. So it disappears at 5. At the 1 mark, it stays, it becomes strawberry, disappears, or becomes chocolate in the southern half, and then strawberry in the top half. All right. Well, you definitely have enough uh, tips and tricks now for GeoGebra to be able to make your project look gorgeous. So uh, good luck and have fun with it.